First, I have a few announcements. Actually, I have quite a few announcements to share this morning. Um, on Sunday, April 14th, everyone is invited to, enjoy, to join us for the new members' welcome reception during fellowship time. And please join us at the 10.30 a.m. service as we welcome and meet the new members of St. Paul's family. Um, Butter braids are still available through April 12th, and this is a fundraiser for St. Paul's Preschool, the last one for the year. Um, samples are available in Fellowship Hall this morning, so you might want to check that out. Um, Mary Circle is still open to receiving items and donations for Church World Service hygiene kits. Um, items are due by Mary Circle's meeting, which is on Thursday, April 11th. On April 18th, we will have our annual Maundy Thursday soup su supper at 6 p.m., followed by a 7 p.m. Lenten service. Uh, St. Paul's will host their annual Easter egg hunt on Saturday, April 20th at 10 a.m. Um, in case there's bad weather, the hunt will take place um, in the lower level of the church. And all children through sixth grade are encouraged to anticipate, uh, participate and be sure to bring your own baskets or, or bag to collect the eggs. A couple more things. On May 5th is um, Aspire Ladies' Night Out. Flyers are available in the marketplace. Uh, registration is now open for VBS and applications can be found at the marketplace or online. And registration is now open for St. Paul's summer camps. There are seven camps for ages three through third grade and the applications are on the St. Paul's website. And uh, Jeannie Nolly asked me to um, add this announcement. There's one big jar of spaghetti sauce as well as six little jars uh, for sale. So those are available in the narthex in case you're interested. Okay, thank you.
stand as you are able for the call to worship. Come, friends, and sit with him who cares for family and strangers alike. We gather with the one whose lavish love has been poured out for all. Let us bring to him our best and pour out our lives as a gift to him. May our hearts be open to the beauty of Christ's presence as we worship in spirit and in truth. Will you please remain standing and sing to the Lord, Jesus, the very thought of thee. Please join me in the unison prayer. God of love, love you, you have, have loved, loved us first and, and continue, continue to love us lavishly. We come this morning longing to love you in return. We hunger for your healing love in our lives as we long to love ourselves and our neighbors. Will you fill our longing hearts as we join together to worship you so that we may pour out our very lives as an offering of praise and love for you in this world. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Thank you, will you please be seated? And will you continue in prayer this morning? And as we continue in prayer, I invite you to share any joys or concerns that you bring today, people or circumstances that we might lift up and hold in the light of God. I'll begin by asking, will you remember in your prayers the family of Chuck Huddle, especially his wife Shirley and daughter Julie. We celebrated Chuck's life here in worship yesterday and commended him to God's care. So please remember Chuck and his family in your prayers. Do you have other folk you would lift up this day in joys and concerns? Yes, uh, Carla? Um, prayers for my mother Gwen, who is experiencing a lot of pain, is, in, is under hospice care now. Thank you. Carla. Um, sure, uh, yeah, Cheryl. The son of my good friend, his name is Chuck. He had uh, throat cancer and then he had a stroke afterwards. He's only 62. Pray for Chuck. Uh, John in the back. I just wanted to express a great joy for our spaghetti dinner, for all the volunteers that helped out uh, making cookies and spaghetti and sauce. Uh, just as was fantastic, and, and everybody who joined in with us to help our, our missionaries. 
as they go out and, and express God's love to others. Thank you very much, John. Anyone else? I invite you uh, now into a time of quiet prayer. Loving God, thank you for pouring out your love upon us today and every day. Thank you for loving us through people who surround us with their hopes and their care, their prayers for us. Thank you for this time where we can come away and bring to you our joys and concerns in prayer and worship. Thank you for this time where we may sing to you beautiful words, beautiful music, and hear from you through your word what is really important in our lives. Thank you for helping us to see what is important, for helping us to organize our priorities and understand where we would best give our time, talent, and treasure. Thank you, God, for loving us always, even when we stray from what is really important. Thank you for calling us back to loving one another and ministering to those in need around us. Thank you for giving us a vision through Jesus Christ of a world where peace reigns and justice rolls down like a mighty river. Thank you for calling us into a consistent life where values of love, justice, and peace align with both our words and our actions. Thank you for forgiving us when we miss the mark and loving us always. Thank you for welcoming the stranger for reaching out to the poor and needy. Thank you for your steadfast love. We come before you seeking to serve as best as we're able, to give our best as best as we can, knowing that you are always with us. These things we pray in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and we pray the prayers that he taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Apostle writes, My sisters and brothers, I implore you by God's mercy to offer your very selves to God, a living sacrifice dedicated and fit for God's acceptance, the worship offered by mind and heart. Adapt yourselves no longer to the pattern of this present world, but let your minds be remade and your whole nature be transformed. Then you will be able to discern the will of God and know what is good acceptable and perfect.
We bring our gifts to you and offer them as symbols of sacrifice and service. We seek to share the story of suffering love that fulfills and conquers death. Bless these gifts and all who give. Use our wealth, our time, and our abilities for the good of all of your people, O Lord. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. 
And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Do you use a daily devotional? I know some of you use this. This is called These Days, Daily Devotions for Living by Faith. Our church provides these free of charge to anyone who would like to have one. I recommend a daily devotional, and I recommend this particular one. This is a solid um, effort, and we've provided it for years. Again, I know some of you avail yourselves of this. Uh, we keep these out by the name tags. Uh, so if you do not uh, have a daily devotional, I encourage you to use this. It's just a brief reading, a scripture, and a prayer. Um, it takes five minutes. Keep it by your bedside. I encourage this. This I found to be very helpful. In years past, I subscribed to another devotional, and it's now gone the way of so many print publications. It's now online, but for over two decades, I subscribed to this devotional called Alive Now. And it um, was something I first came across at Mountaintop. It was used in worship and devotions there, and it's organized thematically. And uh, this one from March, April 2014, the theme for that uh, publication is, I know you can't all see it, is priorities. And I'd like to share with you what the editor wrote to introduce this particular issue. Her name is Beth Richardson. This is what she wrote. She said, do you know what your priorities are? If I rated my priorities according to the amount of time I spend on things, my list would look something like this. Number one, my job. Number two, sleep. Number three, my dog. Number four, fitness. Number five, housework. Number six, playing with technology. Number seven, television. And she went on to say, way down on my list would be church, family, and prayer time. This self-reckoning is a bit disturbing to me. It doesn't match the priorities I carry in my heart. It's a bit misleading to determine priorities based on time spent. After all, there are some things a person must do in life, like laundry, and the time these things take may be disproportionate to the value or satisfaction they bring. Perhaps I should ask myself, am I spending enough time on the things that are priorities to me? Or am I spending too much time on things that have no value or that are contrary to my priorities? What if, as we examine this topic, we would be guided by Jesus' priorities as we know them through the scriptures? I shape these pages with information from the excellent book, The Jesus Practice, Eight Essential Habits by Christopher Miracle. Miracle identifies Jesus' priorities based on Jesus' most repeated words and actions in the Gospels. From these eight, I have focused on Jesus' top three priorities. That's for this particular issue. And she lists those as heal, love, and pray. Now, the reason I'm reading this to you is because as I was thinking about our Bible story today, I was thinking about what is most important to me. What are my priorities? 
Because that's how I understand this story. I understand this story to be, at least in part, about priorities. This woman named Mary comes in and she spills, pours, anoints this tremendously expensive perfume over Jesus and wipes his feet with her hair. Uh, a very intimate act, very much out of the cultural norm for that day. And uh, Judas says, well, you know, we could have we sold that. That was about a year's worth of wages and given the money to the poor. And then Jesus' response is about priority. Now, nowhere does Jesus say in the story the poor aren't important. And um, Jesus says elsewhere in the New Testament, in the Gospels, that he's come for the poor. He's come expressly, expressly to preach good news to the poor. And we know about his ministry to the poor. But there are occasions in life where our priorities change. And there are moments where certain things raise to the top of the list, and often those moments are around the experience of perceived loss. Have you ever experienced the perception that I'm going to lose something? And, and in that recognition that I'm going to lose something, and often it's not a thing, it's a person, all of a sudden that thing or that person becomes so much more important. All of a sudden we see that thing or that person in a whole new light. Whereas before we might dwell on that person's um, lesser qualities, now, all of a sudden, we see how much they really mean to us. It's almost like someone flipped a switch and we see the world in a whole new way. Have you ever experienced this? Do you know what I'm talking about? Because that is what the passage is talking about. It is talking about how priorities are changed in the light of Jesus' death. This is a passion story. He's just, as John says, six days away. Six days away from the Passion, they're almost to Jerusalem. Bethany's just a few miles outside. And he's saying, this woman recognizes that I'm about to give my life. I'm about to leave you. And she's anointing me for my death. Now, we may not understand that anointing thing. That was a custom that uh, was part of their burial custom back then, the way that they would anoint. And so it's Jesus' death that places this reprioritization into action or into effect. It's not that the poor are not important, but Jesus calls us to ask what, what is really important and do you recognize in your life what is temporary or fleeting or you may lose? A woman said to me, the best advice her father ever gave her was go to the funeral. Go to the funeral. Karl Barth, the great Christian theologian and teacher and author, said that when the preacher stands up in front of the congregation, the preacher should have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And so I brought, I brought two newspaper articles for you this morning from my uh, hometown newspaper of Springfield. I'm gonna share one with you now. I'm gonna wait on the other one a little bit later. But this caught my eye. They're both about things that are happening this weekend in my hometown of Springfield. This happened yesterday. It was a funeral procession. And uh, this fellow named Ronnie Davis died very, very suddenly. And they still don't know how how this happened. They don't know what happened. He'd been feeling well. He just had blood pressure. He was 60, um, but for over 20 years, he drove a garbage truck. And here are some of the things that people said about Ronnie. His wife said he really loved his job. Customer service was his thing. A person who worked with him, a woman 
by the name of Loretta said he may not have been the fastest worker, but he seldom missed a day of work and did a good job handling both the physical and mental demands of operating heavy machinery, dealing with customers, and operating safely in traffic. Another driver for the uh, waste disposal company, John, said, that man could make you laugh. He had all sorts of stories. And then another fellow, his supervisor, said, Ronnie would never complain. He was a rare breed. So he passed away after driving for this company for well over 20 years, the garbage truck. Again, he was 60 years old. And you know what the garbage company did? They organized a funeral procession. And as part of the funeral procession, there were a dozen 16-ton garbage trucks. These blue trucks, following the hearse all the way out to Oak Hill Cemetery, the front garbage truck had a big black wreath on it. And many of the fellows that he worked with took time off to go to the service. It was really striking. It says in the article, a number of the people were in their shirts, sitting in the back of the church. As the preacher, a fellow named Larry Luster said, he's quoted in the article, I wish someone would quote, quote me in the newspaper. <laughs> not, not really. The preacher said, this life is not forever. It's time to get right with the Lord. Death is an appointment with God you are going to keep. You can't change that appointment. It will happen exactly when God wants it to happen. That was how the article ended. I was surprised by that. Here this man, all of a sudden, is gone. And the garbage company, I'm sure they kept picking up garbage. They stopped. They organized this grand processional. They went out to the funeral home. They went all the way out to the cemetery, driving the big garbage trucks, honking their horns. It's amazing when we're going to lose someone or something, how all of a sudden our priorities change. Always go to the funeral, my father said. And so the question is, the question is, do you, do you know what is really important to you? Do you know who is really important to you? That's the first question Jesus asks. Jesus calls us through this passage to consider the priorities of our lives. And it is remarkable to me how we as human beings can so easily forget those priorities. Life just comes at us, and sometimes we get caught up, and we go down these rabbit trails, and the next thing you know, we're giving our time and our energy and our thought to things that are not all that really important. What is really important? That's a very vital question for the living of our lives, it seems to me. But that's not just where Jesus stops. Because he comments, or the story at least, comments on the nature of this woman's gift. Now, this is a very extraordinary gift. Um, as, as you heard Judas say, well, this was worth almost a year's wages, 300 denarii. A denarii was a, a worker's wage for one day. So basically, 10 months. Ten months wages, your salary, annual salary is $36,000. This jar of perfume costs $30,000. And now it's all over Jesus. So the second question is this. You know what's important to you? Are you giving your best to that? It's one thing to be able to identify your priorities like 
Beth Richardson. She can say, I know, I know what in my heart my priorities are, but then when I look at my life, I recognize I am not giving my best to those priorities. And what is your best? Well, my best might vary from, from day to day. Today my best might be an A minus, tomorrow it might be a C plus, but am I giving my best? I mean, am I praying about this? I remember reading Larry Dossie's book, Healing Words. Larry Dossie is a physician, and he wrote a book on his experience as a medical doctor and his faith as a Christian man. And he said, it dawned on me one day, if I really want my patients to get better, why am I not praying for them? Does your doctor pray for you? I, I don't know. Maybe she does. Are you giving it your best? I mean, to the things that really matter, are you giving that person your best? Or are you just taking them for granted? They're always going to be there. They get my second best. I get to take out on them my worst. Or do I give them my best? This is the second article that came to mind. Another thing happening this weekend in, in my hometown. Generally, my hometown is not this exciting. <laughs> but this caught my eye, and I had to share it with you immediately. I, Oh, I really like this article. And the title of it is Seven Longtime Girl Scouts from Troop 6400 Honored This Weekend. And this is an article, I'm not going to read it to you, but it's an article about seven girls who are all seniors in high school. They're all seniors at the same high school. Rochester High School, which is right outside of Springfield. And the reason that this is in the newspaper is that these girls have done a remarkable thing. Um, if you have any experience with Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, you may know that oftentimes young people who are involved in these groups, not always, and, and we have many exceptions in our church family, but oftentimes when seventh grade hits, they drop out, very common. But these seven girls, all but one, have been in the same group, starting with brownies, I guess maybe even before that, starting with Dave, since kindergarten. Six of these girls have been in the same group for 13 years now. And it talked about, this article talked about their accomplishments. Some of these girls have received the Girl Scout Gold Award Project, which is the highest award a Girl Scout can receive. One girl, a girl by the name of Sydney, Sydney Grayston, she did a project called Girls Against Bullying because she had been, she had been a victim of bullying when she was young, and she received the Girl Scout Gold Award for that. Another girl, by the last name of Emma Burris, she began at her church, and they're honoring these girls today at this church, Real Life Church in Rochester. She began at her church a food pantry. And this food pantry serves 50 families every week she began this. And it's still continuing. Her mother's involved with this. They modeled it after another local church-run food pantry, and this is what she said. We model it as if we let the people come in and pick what they want. That's wonderful. There's guidelines on how much they can take, but they get to pick what they want instead of just handing them a box of food that they may or may not like. Another girl worked in a recovery and awareness program with habitat and nesting sites for bluebirds and other native cavity nesting species for her gold award. And she set up these nesting boxes at conservation reserve areas around Hillsboro, another little town outside of Springfield, collecting data on nests, eggs, hatchlings, and fledglings 
which were later submitted to the Blue Beard Society for its research and national database. She's going on to be a pre-med major in college. Another girl renovated the children's activity at the Sojourn Shelter and Services, which offers victims of domestic violence a place for their children. She renovated that space. She's going to get her doctor of pharmacy degree at the University of Kentucky. Another girl got her gold award raising awareness about food allergies at her school. On and on, another girl started an after-school tutoring program for students in a local school from kindergarten through fifth grade. These are high school students, teenagers. She plans to go into the ministry. I just read this article and I thought to myself, because they comment about how many girls drop out. One girl said, I made a promise to my best friend when I was in middle school, I was gonna stay the course. I was gonna stay all the way through high school. My friend did not keep the promise, but I've kept it. You just hear what these girls are doing. They're, they're giving their best. They're doing the very best they can. I'm not saying it's perfect. I don't know the ins and outs of the program. I'm sure there was lots of frustration and failure along the way, but they're giving their best to the priorities that they have in their life. And I would just ask you this morning, what would you say about your own self with regards to those questions? First, do you know what is really important? I thought about starting this sermon by asking you just to write down on a piece of paper if there was a fire in my house. And I know that all the people and the pets were safe. What were the three things I would take? But I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that when we really get down to brass tacks, it's not a It's about those people. What is most important to you? That's the first question. The second question is, are you giving your best to them? Will you please join me in the unison invitation to the table? When we, as people of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, commune together, our sense of true community is enhanced. When we meet Jesus at his table, class, culture, race, language, economic status, and educational achievements are all transcended. Here is a paradox. In our diversity, we find unity when we share the Lord's bread. Let us approach this time of communion and community, not only sharing the bread and wine, but also sharing ourselves, our hopes, our faith, our history, and our future. Let the people of God come to share the bread and witness a miracle. The great truths of our faith intersect with the realities of the world around us, and we see anew how God is at work in our world. Come and hear in the recesses of our souls Christ's call to here and now at this table. Share his bread so that we may be refreshed and empowered as his people to remember him and therefore live for him. Thus we become a part of the miracle we witness. Let us share the bread in unity and remembrance.
Will you please stand as you're able and sing to the Lord, What wondrous love is this? Over and over, the Psalms sing to us that God's steadfast love endures forever. There is no time when God will stop loving you. There is nothing you can do that will remove God's love from you. God's steadfast love is with you now and always, and we may live our lives into the ways of repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation, and share the love of God in word and deed. Jesus of Nazareth says, this is the most important thing. Amen. <laughs> 